Hello, everybody, and welcome to Market Talks. I'm Ray Salman, Head of Markets at Cointelegraph. Here in this show, we discuss the latest in what's shaping the markets with valuable insights from industry leaders, traders, and influencers. Uh, today's show is sponsored by XGO, and our guest today is Dave Weisberger, the CEO and co-founder of CoinRoutes, uh, a business which provides algorithmic trading and consolidated market data products for digital assets across multiple exchanges and liquidity providers. Dave has over 35 years of experience in market structure, quantitative finance, and trading automation. He started his career at Morgan Stanley, where he built their first program and electronic trading systems. Dave is a strong believer in economic freedom um, and an advocate for digital assets. Here's a short video about Dave. Howdy, Dave. Hello, Ray. How are you today? <laughs> I'm great. Feeling good. Uh, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for making the time. I think the audience will really benefit from your knowledge and experience in this space, in the TradFi space and also in the crypto space. Well, I, I hope so. And thank you for having me on. Well, let's dig right into it. It's a lot happening. There's a lot of headlines. It's been quite busy this week, all the way up to uh, five minutes ago. So uh, on the price action side, Bitcoin and many cryptocurrency prices are doing far better than I expected, which gives me a great sense of relief. Um, I'm happy that Bitcoin's pushing at 30,000. Uh, it just, I mean, considering that we may have quote unquote bottomed at 15,800, it just feels good to be back at 30,000 and working in media and being familiar with the sector and thinking about Bitcoin miners, I know that 30,000 is, it's okay. We can break even here. We can not lay off people. We can manage to be somewhat profitable at this price point. So that gives me a lot of encouragement, but at the same time, I'm getting this feeling that the real war against cryptocurrency has started. So yesterday we learned about the SEC issuing a Wells notice to Coinbase. I mean, it was at, they always do this at the at the closing bell, right? Or a little bit after the closing bell. That's when you get earnings or that's when you get bad news. So it's it can't impact the stock price, right? So we found out about that. Um, and then we figured out that there was enforcement action by the SEC carried out against Justin Tron and a number of celebrities. And then you informed me, I wasn't even aware, that the White House has now issued a statement uh, cautioning investors against interacting with cryptocurrencies. So What's your take on all these recent enforcement actions? Well, very broad question. Uh, my take is that there is an extreme leftist component, which unfortunately seems to be the, in the ascendancy, that for reasons that I don't really understand, because they claim to be progressive, which is generally generally thought of as helping individuals versus large companies, how this particular element, and Gary Gensler is sort of the personification of that at the SEC, Elizabeth Warren in the Senate, who want extreme government control over the economy. And they seem to be the, in, in the ascendancy. And they correctly view Bitcoin as a threat to their ability to print money inf infinitely. And they correctly view DeFi and much of what's going on in, in the crypto technology space as a threat to the oligopolistic uh, behavior of financial institutions. And so they're trying to effectively do the moral equivalent of going back in time and killing it in its, in its infancy. Unfortunately, in this particular case, they waited too long. And now over 20% of Americans have invested in crypto. Now there's an enormous subculture of Americans, generally on the poorer end of the spectrum, which are even more into crypto than the rich. And so they're really taking out at the knees their own constituents. The issue is to get the constituents to understand that. So w w why do I say it this way? I say it this way for a couple of reasons. There's really three legs to their strategy. 
And you know, I didn't want to believe it, but you know, when Nick Carter started talking about Operation Choke Point, I think with you, but certainly with 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 your publication, uh, it, it was clear that they're trying to deny access to the banking system was part of their strategy. It is also clear that the SEC's steadfast refusal to work with the industry to build rules that are workable, they continue to be disingenuous. They continue to lie about that. Make no mistake, it is literally impossible for either a crypto issuer or a crypto exchange to comply with SEC rules because SEC rules do not work for either. And when you make the claim, come on in and register, the reality is it's not just disingenuous, it is a lie. Gary Gensler has lied to people in this industry saying it's possible. The reality is if you're a crypto issuer and you have a token that is being issued either from a foundation or with the, or airdrop to an open source community or earned by an open source community, there is no corporate issuer. Yet Edgar, the system that they want you to file under, quite literally on page one, you have to start giving information about a corporate issuer that in many cryptos don't exist, certainly doesn't exist for Bitcoin, certainly doesn't exist for Ethereum. And that's a serious problem. On the, the trading side, it's worse. The trading side, crypto are 24 seven, full multi-currency market with on-demand settlement. And none of those three things is allowable under the current SEC rule set. So that is an issue. Hester Peirce, who called for the right approach five years ago, which was a safe harbor and work with the industry to write new rules, has gotten increasingly agitated of late. I mean, she doesn't act agitated. She's brilliant. And, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for Commissioner Peirce. But the fact is, is she's come out and said what I've been saying for two years, which is Chair Gensler seems much more concerned with jurisdiction than he does with protecting investors and facilitating capital formation. So that's what I think. I also think it's a huge mistake because the United States has gained from primacy in financial markets, from having the most efficient financial market and having the dollar as the global reserve, stand, you know, global reserve currency. Basically, we've been able to import the standard of living from the rest of the world because of this. We've been able to form capital better than the rest of the world because of this. And by pushing crypto away, we risk both. And I'd love to delve into that more, but I know you have some questions specifically to talk about it. But as an opening diatribe, I think that should be sufficient. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Strong words, uh, all backed with, uh, with I believe, to be good evidence um, or a good explanation. So uh, the thing that gets me is that um, regulators have always been against cryptocurrency, almost globally all regulators seem to have an issue with crypto startups and with cryptocurrencies in general. Um, and it just, to me, it makes sense. Wouldn't it have made more sense to have created a, to created some sort of, I guess what I'm trying to say is we've been through FTX. We went through Terra Luna. We've dealt with all the DeFi hacks and scams. Investors do need protections. So, why legislate after the fact and on the fly? Why do that? Why not create some sort of framework where there's more oversight into crypto startups and um, people who list cryptocurrencies and, and then there can be more protections and more transparency. Why is the US government so against cryptocurrency? Well, let's unpack what you just said. So first, globally, uh, what may have been true in the past is clearly not true anymore. So you have MICA uh, in Europe, you have the FCA in the UK requesting industry consultations to try to effectively regulate crypto as financial assets. We have word out of Hong Kong in terms of opening up that market for crypto under a regulatory regime. We have Singapore, which has a Japan with evolving crypto regulation. The U.S. is really an outlier among major countries without a regulatory framework. Now, there's historical reasons why it boils down to politics. And the simple fact is that we have two committees in this, in both the, the Senate and the House of Representatives. We have the Agriculture Committee, which oversees commodities and really commodity derivatives. And we have the Finance Committee, which oversees banks and brokers. And they have been fighting over crypto since crypto started. Crypto is unique because it is a 
fully transparent, fully electronically tradable asset with real-time prices that is arguably a commodity, but they're under the CFTC, which is what regulates commodities, they have historically only regulated derivatives and not the spot commodities, except when they see manipulation that goes into the derivative market. So spot gold compared to spot Bitcoin. Spot gold is incredibly opaque. You could call different brokers and be wildly off on what the prices are. The spreads are wide. There's nothing close to the market data. I mean, at CoinRouts, we process 10 terabytes of market data across crypto exchanges globally. So there is a lot of data. It is very transparent. So that's a very big difference. But there's no structure in the US for regulating electronically traded commodities. So you have this, this food fight that's been going on. And frankly, if one analyzes the actions of the SEC, particularly under Chair Gensler, you can make the argument that Hester Peirce has made, which is he's doing things for, for jurisdictional purposes, i.e. going after uh, Do Kwan when he's going to, you know, we know that Korea is the one who's likely to be extraditing him from Montenegro this morning. The reason he did it is there was no one to fight back against him classifying crypto as, as a security. So it's really about turf. But there's one point I really think it's important to make, which is something that the leaders of the crypto industry pretty much universally agree, which is principles-based regulation would be a good thing. And the way I like to express it is there are four key principles that you know, if you talk to, and, and Brian Armstrong has been very public about this recently, so I give him lots of credit from, you know, from Coinbase, obviously. Uh, but there are four principles, and they all have great lessons. Number one, and let's start with this, protect customer assets. If you're in equity, you have SIPC and the ability for, if you're, you buy IBM and your broker goes bankrupt, it's not a question. You're going to get your IBM shares because they're not even held in the broker's name. It's in street name and the, the law, legal process has been sorted out for that to happen. In crypto, there's no good way for exchanges or others to protect your asset right now. And there is a need for that. The second principle, which is has come out to be very critical over the last two weeks is something that that is why a lot of what you talked about happened in 2022 and it's also why bank failures happened in the last two weeks and that is companies who take financial you know assets from customers and have their and, and basically customers invest should be forced to make fair accurate and full disclosures of the risks they are taking with the customer's assets so, for example, if you are a depositor at Voyager, you should know you should they should have known that instead of pure agent lending of of crypto that was deposited at Voyager, they were making uncollateralized loans to an Asian hedge fund. If you were an investor in Celsius, you should have known that they were doing principal trading and doing trades like the GBTC ARB trade with your money. And if you're an investor in Silicon Valley Bank, you should have known that they had billions of dollars in unrealized losses on their books from investing in treasuries before the Fed started raising rates. They have the exact same pathology, and it's the same thing. So when people criticize crypto, rightly, they should understand that it's the same problem that's impacting the banking system. Only the cost to the banking system is, is dwarfs anything that's happened in crypto. But just to complete the other two, the, so the third principle is what I call uh, fair and orderly markets. A lot of people call it differently. Basically, you want to know that electronically traded markets are operating fairly, that manipulation is a crime and people will get punished for it so as to disincentivize that happening. You want markets to be fair. And lots of people in crypto don't really argue that one, but I can tell you professional investors demand it, and it's kind of a big deal. And the fourth is if you are acting as a fiduciary, that you should do things in your client's interest. This is things like best execution, which is what CoinRoutes is focused on, delivering better prices when buying or selling. But it's just as important to understand customer suitability if you take somebody's money and they have uh, liquidity needs within the next three months, don't put it in incredibly volatile things. So these sorts of things are, are underlying the financial system, and most people in crypto agree with them also. Unfortunately, it's not what the U.S. regulators are doing. Yeah, which I find quite peculiar. Uh, but let's shift to banks, because you mentioned something about bank failures, and that's definitely still a major headline. 
banks clearly have problems and the Fed is having problems also, uh, which interestingly doesn't seem to be translating to trouble for crypto at the moment, at least in terms of price action over the last two or three months. Uh, but in lay terms, can you briefly explain what was so serious about Silvergate, SVG, First Republic Bank, and that the Fed would step in to provide you know, insurance to all customer deposits and liquidity as needed? Well, the headline is simple. The troubles in the banking sector, the shortfalls, the losses on the books and records of the entire banking system are probably larger than the entire market cap of crypto even today. That is a fact. We've had multiple people coming out and saying that on federal, on U.S. Treasury purchases alone, the banking system probably has a $600 billion shortfall on their books. If you expand that to include mortgage backs and munis and corporate bonds, it's probably significantly larger. But banking rules say that if you hold an asset to maturity and at maturity you're going to get your money back, you don't have to disclose it. That's why two weeks before Silicon Valley Bank failed, their auditors claimed that they gave them a good bill of financial health. That is a huge problem. But this all became known early last weekend or two weekends ago before they installed this policy of backstopping assets through the BTFP program. And this is a big deal. So to put this in lay terms, imagine that a bank, Silicon Valley Bank, bought $100 million worth of face value of government bonds, paying 1.87% interest. Now imagine that those same bonds were worth 60 cents or $60 million because the interest rate in the market is more like 45 to 4.8% on the bonds of the, of, the, of the duration that they held. As long as they could say that their deposits are going to stay constant and they're not going to have to sell those bonds, they didn't have to take that loss. In the case of First Republic that you mentioned, there's also the issue of potential non-performing commercial leases because office occupancy is at 50% uh, throughout their portfolio. So there are unrealized losses. So now put yourself in the position of bank depositors two weeks ago. You read about Silicon Valley Bank going boom. You read about troubles in the banking system. You have on your smartphone the ability to take your money out of the bank in seconds from when the markets opened on Monday morning. So the Fed correctly, I think, feared that there would have been a mass contagion event and that deposits were going to get yanked out of the banking system very fast, forcing panic sales of what are already money losing securities, i.e. treasury bonds, etc., and they didn't want confidence in the banking system to reach that. It literally could have been as bad as anything we saw in 2008. But the fact is there was also financial incentive for people to do so because by doing so, they could actually get higher yields because savings, bond, you know, savings accounts were, were and are uh, returning much lower assets. So they were very concerned about a financial contagion event and frankly, I think right to do so. So their policy has been kind of by you know kind of bifurcated and i predicted this before the fed meeting they the fed did exactly what they expected them to do i actually talked about it uh on sorry if i'm plugging a, a competitor but scott melker's wolf of all streets podcast on monday morning i said this is what they would do because they kind of had to do two things they have to provide liquidity to reassure bank depositors so the banking system doesn't collapse and they have to be seen to be raising interest rates because they don't want inflationary expectations to go crazy. But they left themselves wiggle room yesterday. And he basically said that if the banking system creates tightening, i.e. the recessionary effects of non-bank lend bank lending drying up become too great, that he gave himself the ability to cut rates. And I think that's what people, when they woke up this morning, realized why Bitcoin is trading actually higher than it did before the Fed announcement, or at least it was a few seconds ago when I looked at my screens. Right. Uh, no problem. Scott's a friend, so it's okay. Um, do you think, so Yellen came out, uh, Powell came out, Biden came out, and they basically told this story that these three or four banks are outliers. They're in the auxiliary. The U.S. <laughs> banking system is strong. Banks are profitable. Your money's safe. 
the balance sheets are good. Um, what's your take on that? Is this was this just an isolated event where a few banks went too degenerate and failed to manage their 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 like hedge their risk on these treasuries, or is this something that's more we could say endemic to the banking sector right now? One hundred percent endemic to the banking sector. It happened to be the Silicon Valley Bank's risk management was particularly awful. They didn't match their duration at all. And they had a depositor base that constantly lost money because startups do. They have burn rates and was dependent. It's not a Ponzi scheme, but it was dependent on attracting new customers and new bill and new startups into the fold to maintain their ability to maintain their depositor base. So they were sort of the obvious poster child. Silvergate would probably be alive today if Elizabeth Warren hadn't targeted them. But even so, Silvergate was a was an orderly liquidation, which makes the fact that she targeted them and the contagion spread to Silicon Valley Bank even more ironic. Signature, we have since come to learn, probably would not have needed to liquidate at all. And the FDIC could have been spared two and a half billion dollars that was thrown away because they were told they, they put conditions on buyers of Signature uh, that they couldn't have their crypto uh, accounts and they wanted to shut down Signet. And I hope we talk about Signet because we've done some very interesting studies on the effect on the crypto market of Signet. But let's put a pin in that. But I'm reminded when you were talking, I felt like one of my, I mean, I, I, I admit to having a soft spot for, for Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. There's one of his movies, Commando, where he's holding the bad guy literally with one hand over a chasm. And the bad guy gave him his information. He goes, you remember when I told you, Sully, I will kill you last? I lied. And he drops him into the chasm. The fact of the matter is our politicians when it comes to the banking system, are forced into lying. I think Powell didn't. I think Powell was actually very measured in his words yesterday. And I have enormous respect for him trying to thread the needle that he's trying to thread. I mean, make no mistake, he was handed full authority to fight inflation by this White House, who has essentially abdicated any attempt at fiscal responsibility and leaving it to the Fed. So Powell was pretty measured. Yellen kind of has to reassure people about the banking system because if people are still worried they have to leave they're going to pull their deposits and the cascading effect of that would be massive and to be honest biden's handlers had to tell him put that on the teleprompter for him to say that too for the exact same reason i don't think they're bad people for saying they're trying to reassure people that their deposits are safe the fed basically set up a facility which has $4 trillion behind it if necessary to protect client assets. The problem is that they don't wanna spend that $4 trillion. So they need to reassure people so that they can keep the guns in the, in the chamber rather than having to fire them. So that's what I think is going on there. Well, speaking of spending, everyone and their mother is talking about this chart that shows the Fed balance sheet reversing its quantitative tightening process with this $300 billion backstop, right? And a handful of smart people have told me that the $300 billion, it's not traditional quantitative easing as retail investors have come to know it. Uh, but it also seems a bit contradictory to the Fed's initial kind of objective of tightening, right? So do you think the Fed has lost its battle with inflation? And do you view this chart as sign of a pivot? I view this chart for exactly what it is. It is a recognition that the Fed needs to have money printer go burr to appeal to our crypto friends. But instead of the left side of the chart, where it rise, where the raise was happening, they were buying assets and asset securities and propping up asset markets in 2020. This time, they're simply making money available to a system that has significantly impaired collateral on their balance sheets. And so rather than directly targeting asset prices to make people feel more wealthy, they're not doing that. That's what people think of as quantitative easing. What they're doing instead is making the entire power of the Federal Reserve stand behind bank deposits. So bank, so, so people who have money in savings accounts don't want to pull that money out. 
That's what they're doing. Now, the unfortunate fact is it's still money printing. It's still more, you know, the money supply going up. And 300 billion is a tip of the iceberg if all the realized losses have to be papered over. Most estimates I've seen say that it will top out somewhere around $2 trillion, but it could go farther. It's a lot of money being released into the economy and a lot of money specifically to shore up what Mark Yusko likes to call, phrase as the legacy system of trust. Whereas we think of crypto, and he describes crypto, as a system of authoritative, technologically driven truth, which should replace that system of trust. So the reason that I've become very bullish on Bitcoin in particular is because we are literally having a new, another inflection point. I'll call it another genesis moment for Bitcoin, where it's become readily obvious that instead of quantitative easing, which is indirectly going to find its way into the hands of risk assets like Bitcoin, this is much more targeted. This is money specifically targeted to restore trust in a system when Bitcoin is an alternative to having to have that trust. And so I think it's a very big deal in the history of Bitcoin. And while it may not be called quantitative easing and it may not be targeting asset prices, in Bitcoin specifically's case, I think it's actually more direct. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. I hope I did. No, that was fantastic. And uh, you touched on something that I was speaking to some guys that work at funds the other day, and it's all qualitative. It's emotional. I can't put it into metrics. And these are database guys. You know, they're looking at correlations. They're looking at money inflows and outflows. They're considering all these other factors because I was just pointing out to them that, hey, Bitcoin price is up like 40% since banks melted down. And sure, perhaps the market was oversold. Maybe it's uh, uh, two standard deviations away from the median price. So it's a mean reversion. Sure, you can use whatever math or technical analysis or economic theory to explain what's happening. Go ahead and do that. Um, but I think there's an emotional component. The tide went out. And all of America saw that banksters are sitting in the sea, but naked, right? Like we saw that these guys are insolvent. They don't know what they're doing. Inflation is incredibly sticky. The job market's still strong. Wages are still high. You know, it just, I saw these bank balance sheets and the issues that they have and just thought, this is another reason for Bitcoin. This is an ideological strong point for Bitcoin surely some of the price action we're seeing from Bitcoin is somebody, whether it be smart money or dumb money, making the decision to hedge their risk or to go long or to just seek out a more sensor resistant, transparent alternative. What do you think? Is it all numbers or is there an emotional component to this? I, I want to I try to educate your audience a bit on Bitcoin price because it's, it's very important for people to understand it. There are there are those who say, well, it's an 80 vol asset. That's what the math guys will tell you. And I think it's probably maybe even higher now. I don't know. Uh, but effectively, Bitcoin's price is trading like an option on its future adoption. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Bitcoin is going to be there's a certain range of outcomes. And, and I'm going to mention three. Uh, out, out, that I think are the most likely, and there's a fourth. So the, the three that are the most likely are, in my opinion, most likely Bitcoin, Bitcoin becomes digital gold. It gets the full market cap of what gold's market cap would be for its monetary value, not its connector value in electronics, not its value in jewelry as, oh, that's pretty, but its monetary value. And I would say that, that gold's monetary value is at least three quarters of its market cap. And, and you get that by looking at, at the math of gold's ratio in the Earth's crust to things like silver or platinum. Platinum is much rarer than gold, yet cheaper, but it's valued for actually as more industrial use than gold. It's generally higher value in jewelry, yet gold is more expensive. Why? Because gold has historically had a monetary value component. Now, Bitcoin has been taking some of that. My guess is Bitcoin digital gold value its price, if it reaches that level to where the world commonly refers to it as digital gold, is somewhere over 500000 and, you know, between 500000 and a million dollars per individual Bitcoin. I personally think we should start using Satoshis because it'll make it more relatable to the average person, but that's a different story. But that's one thing. A second, more extreme value 
on Bitcoin, which would place it at many, many multiples of that, would be Bitcoin replaces all monetary aggregates. Now, let me explain. In When Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, gold essentially represented the value market cap of gold was basically 100% of all the, the monetary aggregates in the world. It, fa it, it is now less than 10%. It's still important, but it's less than 10%. So the difference between Bitcoin as digital gold and Bitcoin as representing a Bitcoin standard is at least 10x and maybe more. So those are the two very bullish outcomes. The market at today's price is placing somewhere around a 5% probability of that happening, of, the, of Bitcoin as digital gold happening. I personally think that that probability at this point is dramatically higher than that, which is why I'm so bullish and we could talk about why. But the other two scenarios are, scenario three is Bitcoin stays as a niche instrument used for payment to payment, you know, per peer to peer transfers for people in countries with currencies that are rapidly depreciating or non-trustworthy. That scenario, which is already in place, probably justifies a market cap higher than it is today. Keep that in mind. So the fourth scenario is Bitcoin fades into the historical dustbin like Betamax or other technologies that no longer get used. That seems to be very, very unlikely, yet the market is placing a huge probability that that would happen. So that's how I look at it. But when you look at an option and you look at the actual volatility of option prices on anything, uh, they're much higher than traditional assets. So it's not surprising that Bitcoin is more volatile. Yet, if you go back over the last year, there are many tech stocks that are just as volatile as Bitcoin has been. So it's really kind of interesting. And it's really a long-term probabilistic bull case that I make. But the last two weeks have pointed out why the long-term probabilistic bull case is more likely. I totally agree. One of our analysts always makes the comparison. He says, look at Amazon, look at Apple, look at Netflix, look at um, Microsoft, look at all these other tech stocks, which are instrumental in pushing the Dow and look at how they're all down 50 to 60% per year and look at Bitcoin. And he's like, Bitcoin's a technology, thus it behaves similarly to tech stocks. Tech stocks are down for a variety of reasons. So you don't need to freak out when you see Bitcoin down 50 or 60% when you put things into perspective of what it does, what it's up against, what it's similar to. So I agree with you on that. And um, one, one of your narratives that I think has gained a lot more credibility in the last two weeks is that uh, Bitcoin is becoming the reserve asset against hyperinflation in countries that suffer with broken financial systems and incompetent governments, which most Americans won't believe, but could become a reality for us at some point, hence the allure of Bitcoin. Yeah, I think that it's really important. And look, I am not a Bitcoin maxi on the one hand, because I see two things at play here. And I always differentiate Bitcoin from the rest of crypto. It trades the same way that other crypto assets do. And that's important from a regulatory point of view, but it has a very different point. Bitcoin is a value instrument. It has scarcity. It has all of the characteristics that one would in a textbook to find money to have. Provable scarcity, verifiability, impossibility to counterfeit, portability in a digital sense, transactability. All of these things make it superior for money. And that is very different than uh, the, 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 the actual use cases for DeFi, of which Ethereum is the dominant asset right now, but there are many, many others in the DeFi ecosystem. The DeFi ecosystem has a use case that people continually in the Bitcoin Maxi world ignore, which is there is a financial oligopoly that makes economic rent from a variety of financing activities that will all be replaced by this developing technology. Now, whether it's replaced by the current coins, you know, Ethereum, et cetera, which I think is highly likely, or replaced by some new things as it gets developed, the, these are multi-trillion dollar markets, securities lending, repo, interest rate swaps. And so there's a big use case for crypto as well. And that threatens the oligopoly that is the biggest donors to many of the politicians that are attacking crypto. Whereas Bitcoin doesn't have, you know, it, its threat is to people opting out 
of a system that is over leveraged and are supporting banks and doing other things like that. So I always look at this differently. And so I do think that you can see why Bitcoin will sometimes trade like a risk asset and the rest of crypto will quite often trade like risk assets. But there's something else going on today. What's going on is people are seeing both Fed money printing as a necessity to combat opacity in the financial system. And make no mistake about it, Bitcoin is the most transparent financial system ever invented. Every transaction is on the blockchain and everyone who trades Bitcoin is transparent about their market data. Yes, there's a lot of lack of knowledge of some of the market microstructure, but its transparency is clear. It is directly contrasting to the financial system where most people don't even know that when they push the button on Venmo and it's going through the ACH plumbing, that it's days before the money actually moves. Most people don't know that because the banks insure them from that. This is why when Mar I, I gave Mark Esco credit for it, this is why the technology of truth, i.e. Bitcoin transparency, is superior technology of trust. Banks who, okay, they'll trust each other for certain transactions and give customers credit. But at the end of the day, when that plumbing starts to break down, it is a big problem because there isn't the technology to underlie it that would allow for free and easy movement. So that's why Bitcoin is, is such a, a particularly important innovation. Beautifully said. You're, sp you're spreading the good word of, uh, of Satoshi today. I love it. Uh, so let's get to something that you're even more passionate about. In relation to the crypto sector, it seems that a lot of the major crypto-friendly banks have been dismantled, possibly leaving investors, builders, and crypto-focused businesses debanked and lost at sea. What do you foresee happening uh, to the process of on-ramping and on-ramping from fiat to crypto. And I know that you had said you wanted to say some words about Signet and um, just the relationship between traditional yeah, banks yeah. and crypto in general. So the mic is yours. Yeah, I mean, there's two topics here. Let's 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 unpack them first and second. First, let's talk about the what's going on in so-called Operation Choke Point 2.0. And then I want to talk about how there's no other word other than malfeasance to describe how the banking regulators, what they did with Signature, and how they should be held accountable for, for directly harming investors. So let's get to that one. Prompt me if I don't get to that. But let's talk about Operation Choke Point. So look, we, we at, at CoinRats, we're a software company. We do not touch client assets. So we are not, we don't have unstable deposits. We don't have deposits that move. I want to go back to what the Federal Reserve and the FDIC said in the joint statement they put out about three Thursdays ago before all of this stuff went to hell. So what they said actually made sense. I'm going to repeat myself because people often hear me as just lambasting the regulators. The reality is they said that banks should take into account the volatility of deposits when accepting deposits in their business mix. Now, this was a veiled attack on Silvergate, which had a very high percentage of their deposits as crypto depositors. Now, why is it fair to discriminate at least a little bit against crypto deposits? Well, that's simple. When there's a FOMO market, i.e. the market is moving up, if people have deposits of dollars on Coinbase, Kraken, Bitstamp, etc., those deposits are going to get turned into Bitcoin. They're going to get turned into altcoins. They're going to get sold. And the people who are selling those at increasing higher prices are likely doing so to take liquidity or take profits off the table, which means they're not likely to keep their dollars on the exchange. So exchange deposits during bull runs decrease, especially toward the end when new people don't aren't putting money in. And in bear markets, when it's coming down, which, of course, given crypto is so volatile up and down, this happens all the time, can also decrease, such as, you know, FTX, who stole $8 billion. Well, sure, there were $8 billion less in deposits because they stole them. Well, OK, that shouldn't happen very often, hopefully. Hopefully, we understand that theft is something that needs to be vigorously prosecuted and people won't do it again. But the fact is crypto deposits are more volatile. Does that mean you shouldn't bank them? No. In fact, they said that. What it means is you should take into account business mix and you should evaluate 
companies based upon the stability of their deposits, based upon their credit worthiness and things of that nature. And the reality is most of the companies that are mature in the crypto space are different than startups and people who are going to take customer money in. They may try it and then leave. And so banks need to be aware of that. That doesn't mean to debank them. That means to be aware of that. So that made sense. But what they've done since then is absolutely outrageous. And frankly, if there were ability to impeach regulators for violating their oaths of office, they should happen. So what happened with Signet? Now, look, if anybody out there is going to call Barney Frank a libertarian, that will be one of the funniest things I've ever heard. If they want to call Barney Frank a Republican or even a conservative, that would be insane. And yes, Barney Frank had been paid to be on the board of directors of Signature Bank, so he had a profit motive to stick up for them. But would he really risk his entirety of his reputation if he didn't believe that Signature Bank should have been under the BTFP program allowed to continue because they would have stayed as an ongoing concern? In fact, I think it's almost impossible to argue that he was telling a lie because if you backstop the deposits, who's going to pull their money off of Signature? Instead, what did they do? They sold large swath of Signature's assets, but excluded every company that was involved in crypto and turned off or are threatening to turn off or make it impossible for people to resuscitate Signet, which is the predominant method that exchanges used for inter-exchange movement of dollars. So that had two effects. One we now know, the FDIC had to contribute two and a half billion dollars with a B to bail out, uh, the, you know, the, facilitate the purchase of some of Signature's assets, which need not have occurred. And the second effect is something that we've studied at Coin Routes. The markets in the crypto markets between, if you just do a study, and we're just going to take four instruments to make this easy. Actually, let's just use two. If you look at Bitcoin trading against dollars on Coinbase, Kraken, Bitstamp, and the other large US-based exchanges, and Coinbase and Bitcoin trading against Tether, USDT, on Coinbase, Kraken, Binance, you know, uh, uh, you know whatever, KuCoin, Huobi, OKEx, uh, et cetera. If you just compare those two instruments, what you saw before Signet got threatened to be turned off, you saw more or less the difference between the best bid and the best offer, often backward, of less than a basis point generally about 0.7 basis, you know, something or, you know, but less than a basis point uh, and somewhere around that basis point level. What we saw after Signet got turned off that first weekend, on average, Bitcoin went to eight basis points and Ether went to over 10 basis points of spread for the dollar pairs and the tether pairs were unaffected. Why? Because people couldn't move dollars during the weekend. During the week that closed a little, and came down to be about double what it was beforehand until Coinbase announced that they weren't going to accept Signet anymore, in which case it started widening and we're almost back to where it was on the first weekend. In short, by doing this, the crypto market has been rendered significantly less efficient. This translates into multiple basis points of extra trading costs for all crypto investors. Now, the good news is, and the one advertisement I will do on this program, and I apologize in advance because we studied it, is CoinRoute software, which actually is surveying the entirety of the market before it places an order on any one exchange. Our clients are saving at least half of that excess cost. So our clients are doing relatively better, but the entire market is less efficient than it was before this happened. So that's what I think. That's sort of my, my broad answer. Fantastic explanation. Do you think that the um, difficulty in exchanges moving money around will translate to price dislocation? So will eventually Bitcoin be $400 cheaper or more expensive on Binance versus Coinbase versus Kraken? Are we going to have arbitragers coming in to capitalize on that? And uh, would that be problematic to have dislocations in price? Well, people underestimate the importance of arbitrage in, in financial markets. The reality is arbitrage is a necessary component. And what we saw, and remember coin routes, we started in 2017, so we've been seeing it. Back then, it was routine to have a thousand or two thousand dollar price differences. And point of fact, in the history books, that's how Alameda made their first money before they then went down their journey, but we won't go down that route. 
What we saw last weekend, I was tweeting because I couldn't believe it with my own eyes. We saw Gemini at over $1,000 above where Coinbase was trading, Bitcoin dollar. So yes, we're going to see more dislocations. And yes, I think weekends are going to get particularly bad for people who don't have good technology. So if you are only trading with one exchange and you don't use technology like CoinRoutes provides and some of our competitors provide, you may very well be paying way more or selling way lower if you're on the other side of the equation than you need to. That said, for the most part, arbitrageurs are still working to keep the markets in line. It's just harder for them. And so what you will see is dollars will get moved, but wires don't operate during the, during the, the weekend. So arbitrageurs are going to have to keep more dollars on exchanges uh, in order to be able to do that. One of the interesting footnotes here to give credit to other entrepreneurs is one of the reasons arbitrage isn't nearly as bad as it used to be is at least now with the Fireblocks network and networks like Copper's Clearloop, there are exchanges that cooperatively allow movement of coins much faster. That's why Tether can move from one exchange to another so quickly, and that's why other pairs didn't show the same dislocation. So the answer to your question is, yes, there will be more dislocation. It will cost people more to trade, but it shouldn't be except in cases of exchanges that are really delinked from the system. It shouldn't be anywhere near as bad as it used to be, but it is noticeable and it is important. Mm, okay. Good explanation. Still, with crypto somewhat debanked, even if temporarily, what sort of innovations do you see foreseeing and uh, developing in this space that might compensate for the re reduced number of bridges from fiat to crypto? Well, I think you saw the first domino fall. You saw USDC related, re relocating to Paris. So if Circle relocates to Paris and their stablecoin is regulated under MICA so that the US regulators can't touch it, uh, we will see that become the bridge for on-ramping liquidity. Uh, the reality of the situation is we don't know how strident the US banking regulators are gonna be. It's possible they could be enormously stupid. Uh, as my friend Mike McGlone of Bloomberg is fond of saying, crypto dollars are one of the great innovations in the crypto space. It actually is promoting the US dollars overseas because people use the dollar as a reserve currency. As long as Circle and Tether and other stable coins can do so, outside of the US, we see a very interesting bifurcation here. If the US keeps up the policy of pushing anti-banking crypto and pushing the regulation, we could see a repeat of what happened in the 70s, basically, in the late 60s with the euro dollar market. People don't realize this outside of finance. And, and to give credit, Arthur Hayes, in his most recent missive, gave this background far more eloquently than I will. I encourage everybody to read uh, his, mo his most recent one, just, you just research Medium for Arthur Hayes, and he'll describe it. But what happened was the rise of London as the largest global financial center was facilitated by the U.S. regulators stopping U.S. banks from participating in the euro dollar market, which grew to be the largest financial market in the world. Now, am I saying the crypto dollar market is going to grow to the largest financial market in the world? Well, it actually could if instead of worrying, using controlling central bank digital currencies, uh, the all the people who believe dollar or want to keep the dollar as the standard want to start using things like USDC. Yeah, it could happen. And that would actually be good for the United States. But the other more dark possibility is the U.S. just pushes the innovation overseas and they start denominating those stable coins in euros or euro one or a basket of currencies that isn't the dollar. That would be disastrous for the U.S. economy because it would stop our ability to be importing our standard of living from overseas. And woe be it to the politician that allows that to happen and gets tied with that albatross around their neck. That's why you see certain politicians on the right side of the aisle right as in right-leaning, not necessarily correct, although in this case they are correct, uh, pushing very hard against this narrative of breaking, of stopping banking crypto and pushing innovation overseas. But it is absolutely possible. Right. If, um, for the Americans, if Circle 
moves overseas, headquarters overseas, all their operations are overseas. They're outside of the jurisdiction of, of regulators in the states. What does that mean for my ability to send money from my crypto wallet to Coinbase to my USAA or my Bank of America or Wells Fargo account? Um, is there a, the possibility of Circle then being blacklisted and there's no way for Americans to off-ramp to dollars? I can't say there's no possibility of that. That would be so monumentally stupid for US regulators to do. It's hard for them to believe that it would be true. Frankly, if they did something, if they pushed that far, instead of the approach that they're currently taking, then it could be weaponized against them politically. And I would expect to see more and more Democrats break ranks with that because as as is well documented, uh, the actual adoption of crypto is larger in among poorer people than among richer people. So if in fact it became impossible to participate in the crypto economy, I think that would be a disaster for many politicians who would effectively get forced uh, to go against them. So instead, what have they been doing? They've been doing everything stealthily or they think they were stealthily. It's not so stealthy. So you've seen Operation Choke Point operate without saying it. The banking regulators said, don't discriminate against crypto companies, but behind scenes saying, but you can't buy that. Right. That, that literally is what happened. You see the SEC not saying you can't buy crypto because, of course, they have no jurisdiction to say that. But pay, telling people that buying crypto is like traveling on vacation to Acapulco. Right. They're trying to tell people, they're trying to equate investing in Bitcoin, which has been the best financial decision pretty much anybody has made. And by the way, just a stat for people who understand and want to say my TradFi friends. But no, if you bought a 69,000, it was a disaster. If you started dollar, if you started dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin, when it was at 69,000, you're profitable today. Just think about that for a heartbeat. So the performance of Bitcoin has been such, and as I said, if you believe in the bull case that I laid out before, is likely to be such that telling people they can't invest in it is a political albatross. So they don't want to do that. So instead, the SEC is trying to convince people it's dangerous. They're trying to convince grandma not to invest. They're trying to convince mutual funds, RIAs to stay clear and tell them that they're going to get investigated if they do. This is all stealthy. If you bring this out into the light, however, and get people to admit what they're actually doing, I think you get a very different answer, which is why the biggest hope in my mind is, is the having the, 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 McHenry's committee, the Financial Services Committee, if you read or you watched those committee hearings, you saw a very interesting mix of, of speakers. But many of the congressmen on that committee and congresswomen on that committee were quite eloquent in understanding the need for supporting innovation towards a new financial system. And so I do have hope. I have hope that, Cong that Senator Gillibrand and Lummis's new bill that's going to get reproposed in April will start a real debate in the Congress about how to actually regulate crypto the way I talked about previously, according to actual standards that make sense, as opposed to choking it off. That's my hope. That's the optimistic hat. And hopefully that is the case, because you as an American otherwise could literally be go from having the primary the primacy in the most efficient financial services system in the world to one of the most least efficient financial services systems in the world over a period of a few years if this technology continues to develop at pace. Right. Great explanation. Uh, I recently saw you on Bloomberg, or it might have been CNBC, and you mentioned that fund managers are literally hitting you up left and right, looking to hire you, looking to get your advice on how to position in crypto. And I thought that was curious because given all that's happened with Celsius, FTX, Terra Luna, SBF, all the other black swans, the DeFi rugs, the harsh regulatory environment toward crypto, I would assume that a fund's general uh, stance would be we are avert to high-risk assets, to high-volatility assets. So why are you in such demand and how are institutional well, well, let's, 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 Yeah, let me correct that a little bit. I mean, the, the statement was that the people who work at funds are 
always asking me for personal advice of how to be in this industry, mm -hmm. how they're trying to get their funds to move in that direction. So that's the first thing. And that, that I think is true. And that's for all the reasons we've talked about in terms of a real multi-currency system is far better. A 24-7 system is better. A system that allows and facilitates economic freedom by allowing on-demand settlement to personal wallets is better. There are many things that are better. An open economic system with actual competition, such as DeFi, compared to the securities financing businesses that exist on Wall Street is better. And the people that work there see that. Maybe not the, 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 the CEOs, but everyone underneath that. But the other point that's fascinating that you're going to see the narrative change is you mentioned all the things that happened in 2022 in crypto. So in 2022 in crypto, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of between 10 and $15 billion lost due to a combination of fraud or theft, as in FTX's case, or stupid financial decisions that were not disclosed, i.e. risks that were taken that weren't disclosed, maybe 10 to $15 billion in crypto. And people in the Senate and in the House and in the regulators are saying, you see, you see, this could destabilize the financial system. Except what, what have we seen over the last two weeks? Well, guess what? We've seen many multiples of that lost and having to be backstopped by the Federal Reserve because of exactly the same pathology, undisclosed risks taken in buying treasury bonds. In the case of New Republic, muni bonds, or First Republic, muni bonds. And in the case of corporate you know, leases and corporate um, you know, uh, uh, real estate bonds, in the fact that those bonds have not been adjusted downward for 50% occupancy. So there is a black hole of six hundred plus billion dollars in the banking system that's not been disclosed. And so, yeah, we had an entire year of disaster in crypto because crypto companies didn't disclose their risks. Meanwhile, we now face a situation where the entire banking system hasn't disclosed their risks. So people don't know and need to rely on the Federal Reserve to back that up. So you tell me how the narrative is going to play blaming crypto for this. The narrative should be two wrongs don't make a right. Let's enforce regulations in crypto to accurately disclose risks, and let's change the regulations in the banking sector so that they're forced to disclose risks, at least to their auditors and the regulators. And if you don't do that, more and more money, it will actually accelerate. That's why Belay made the idiotic bet of a million dollar Bitcoin price. He's basically saying, if that house of cards unwinds, that's where Bitcoin goes. And probably he's right if the House of Cards unwinds. That's why the Federal Reserve pulled out effectively the howitzer of, of, of a $4 trillion potential program. And so it's important to understand that people in the financial industry are not dumb. I mean, I still have hundreds of friends in the TradFi industries. And it went literally, Ray, I mean, I'm telling you, in 2017, when I told people that I was leaving IHS market to co-found CoinRoutes with my son, whose idea CoinRoutes was. So at the time, since it was six years ago, he was 24 and he's about to be 30 in this summer. He had the idea, he'd been following crypto for eight years. I didn't know what Ethereum was when I started CoinRoutes. But I've obviously you can tell from my, my speaking in this interview, I am now a zealot for the use cases that exist throughout DeFi and Bitcoin. But Ian brought me in, Ian Weisberger is my son, he brought me in and I was called crazy. I went to industry conferences and people like they felt sorry for me. And then in 2018, they felt even sorrier when Bitcoin started to fall and then crypto winter set in. By 2019, people were like, are you okay? Are you gonna need a job? And I kept getting more and more people asking me if I wanted to go back to work on Wall Street. And I was like, no, 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 no. But here's the funny part, by 2020, People were asking me for how to enter the industry in 2021 still and even through 2022 people were still asking how to get into the industry because they realize these are temporary problems that are all solvable in crypto you with a technology of truth that under underlies crypto yeah there's going to be growing pains but they're solvable problems i'm not sure we could ever reinstall trust on a global system that doesn't have that kind of technology underlying it anymore so that's why the people are interested if the companies are not. What's the dominant vantage point from which in institutional investors are interested in investing in crypto? I think that it boils down to those who actually are closer to ownership of the assets themselves. 
So for example, if you're a mutual fund, only crypto you could buy is the Bitcoin futures-based ETF. Some of them will allow them to buy GBTC because any individual can hold that in a brokerage account, but they have no good way to buy it because the SEC has made it almost impossible for them to do it. If you're a hedge fund and you can trade it, you get, opens up two things. So many, many hedge funds trade crypto. Many of them offer products based around crypto, and therefore they're appealing directly to asset owners. Asset owners have traditionally been told to have some notion of what used to be colloquially referred to as the 60-40 portfolio, which was 60% equities, 40% bonds, or some combination. And that portfolio basic allocation would then expand to include precious metals, et cetera, et cetera. And that was their core portfolio. They also had something called alternative investments and do, where they can invest in everything from private equity to venture capital to real estate. Crypto is put into that section, which is actually significantly smaller. As that becomes more and more normalized, or it becomes the thought of as a hedge like gold is, it opens up trillions of dollars to potential investments in crypto, even if it's only at a very small percentage. So the real question of when the next leg up in crypto is, is when those big pools of assets, the pension funds, the big endowments, the ones who are guided by investment consultants globally, consider crypto or Bitcoin, at least, as a mainstream investment as part of that 60-40 portfolio. And I believe we're still years away from that. I'm not sure that can happen without a regulatory framework that is along the lines of, of the four principles I il illustrated before. But it could certainly happen sooner in Europe with MICA and in the UK if the FCA follows through after their consultation with a coherent framework for crypto assets. And that's why regulation is potentially so potentially beneficial. My mind is blown. My belly is full. I love that you describe yourself as a zealot. I often, I've lost a lot of friends and people don't answer my phone calls. And I try my <laughs> hardest to not talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And I live in the suburbs. I have a daughter. I'm in my house working from home. So nothing happens in my life that's too exciting beyond like daddy daughter dances and going out to have some beers every once in a while, sports and barbecuing, you know, my life is mundane. So whenever I talk to my friends and they're like, what have you been up to? I have to find things to talk about that aren't crypto because I know they don't want to hear about crypto. Uh, but from can henceforth, I, 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 I think I, I, should I, be referred to you. People should call you. I, I just want to say one thing, Ray. I'm yeah? sorry. I, I just want to no, say one ahead. thing because living in Miami, I have a vastly different experience. And before mm -hmm. I say what that experience is, I want to be very clear about something. This is for you, Mr. Gensler. Nothing I am saying should be interpreted as investment advice. Nothing I am saying should be interpreted as guidance or selling of an investment product. Nothing my company does touches client funds. And so we steer clear of all of that. I want to make that very, very clear. Everybody should always do their own research. But what is fascinating is in Miami, almost every conversation I have when people know what I'm what I do for a living, they want to ask me about crypto. I literally was in a local stock, a local store the, you know, that sells CBD products and ended up in, a, in an hour long conversation with the owner of the store who is into NFTs and into crypto and Web3. And we were talking about what's going on in the new economy and how the regulators are making his life miserable, the same as they're making crypto miserable, but how he has roots overseas, et cetera. That is one of a hundred conversations that I've had since I've been down here in Miami, where the culture is very much for new technology and very much for the emerging financial system. So it's funny to listen to you talk about that. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to tell you to move yourself and your daughter down here, <laughs> although you probably would enjoy it, but it is vastly different. And I think it is important. Yeah, yeah, maybe I need to move. Maybe that's maybe that's what's going on or change my friends or find more crypto, crypto focused friends. But um, I really like your energy. This was refreshing. It was deeply enlightening. I know the um, the audience will have enjoyed it. This content and this conversation that you've shared with us, it, I think it will have value for many, many, many months to come because it's so deeply educational and your perspectives and reasons for why you're interested in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and cryptocurrencies are so clear and so sensible. So thank you for coming on and for 
really just clearing up what's uh, something very, it's very difficult to understand what's happening with banks and the Fed and uh, whatever's going on with their balance books <laughs> well, and thank, all that. But thank I think you, Ray. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, you both for your, your kind time. word and for, for having me on. So if our audience wants to know more about you and follow your takes and perspectives on the market, where should they go? Where can we find you? Right. So the, the best place is on social media would be at Dave Weisberger one on Twitter or at coin routes on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at Dave Weisberger on LinkedIn and most important because we post as much of content as we possibly can at www.coinroutes.com where on our website, you'll learn about coin routes, but we also have our insights section and we're adding our in the news section where this video will be front and center because I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Perfect. Perfect. I agree. Thank you for coming on. It sounds like coin routes does a lot behind the scenes. Um, I'm not too familiar with the company. So what's the primary thing that you guys do? We offer people tools to buy lower and sell higher when they've made a decision to buy. So our clients are typically, most of our clients are proprieting firms or institutions that are trading crypto and they use our algorithms to, instead of going out and causing one of those big candles when they want to buy a hundred Bitcoin, we can them concealed in the market intentionally. We do anti-gaming, we do price discovery, and we make sure that we do optimal routing, which listens to that. We help people who trade with market makers by making sure market maker prices are within the exchanges. We help people who are trading on DeFi exchanges by making sure that the prices make sense and by feeding into those markets. And we have enhanced order types for people to actually trade between one instrument and another, spread trading, arbitrage trading as well. So that sort of toolkit. And we are bringing that down in price because you know one of the other stories that you or your your company was nice enough to to talk about was the patent that we filed for five years ago for a distributed smart order routing infrastructure means we can offer enterprise solutions dramatically cheaper dramatically safer and with more data than our competition so people who want an enterprise solution where they have complete control over their wallets and keys can use coin routes and the market data is processed in a separate plant with decisions that's in the same data center of course either tokyo or amazon east right now or in europe but that data never leaves their servers their client information stays there that level of security with access to the full data that's available in crypto as i said before there's 10 terabytes every single day we can offer basically for twenty five thousand dollars a month cheaper than anybody who want to do the same thing as us but doing it in a non-distributed manner so we have that advantage and so our clients are finding that to be a big deal and we're making new solutions to bring it to uh, people who trade less and less over time, or we're trying to bring this down, but there'll be more announcements with us in the future about that. All right. I'm excited to hear more. Uh, off camera, I'll connect with your PR, perhaps if you guys are writing institutional reports and have data insights that you want to share, those are things I'd be interested in looking at in our markets department. So, uh, but we won't, we won't turn this into a business meeting for our audience, but uh, <laughs> Dave, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. I was going to say, I'm, I'm, giving you a new moniker. It's Dave the Baptist. I appreciate how much of a zealot and advocate you are for crypto. So this was a real pleasure. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. All right. Talk with you later. Okay. Thank you so much. I mean, that was incredible. So I look forward to it. How long do you think it takes to go through post editing and all that stuff? Uh, we're live. So it's out um, in a YouTube link. Oh, we'll post even better. That soon. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, so now I am guilty. For those who want to know, I am guilty of dumb questions. Yes, there is no such thing as a dumb question, except for that one was kind of dumb then. So no, thank no, you that's very much, okay. Man. That's okay. That's okay. And we'll do an article wrap up and all that. So um, this is great content. One of the best interviews I've ever done. So I appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you. Have a great day. You too.